Okay, if you'll go, go ahead and grab your seats, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute here at WSU, and on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out okay, to our so event today. Go ahead and grab your seats and um, get started. Uh, our, my name is Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute you're getting some here feedback. at WSU, and on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out okay, to our so event go today. Go ahead and grab your seats. Um, better the second time. Uh, <laughs> I always do. <laughs> I always do. <laughs> I always do. Luckily, <laughs> just sitting in the audience. I think maybe I'd stand up. It's hard to see you around the podium. In any case, I'll go ahead and continue. Um, our topic today is something that we've all become uh, painfully aware of, uh, and it was on display just this last week with the debate over the funding of DHS, and that is the dysfunction uh, that has taken hold of our U.S. Congress. And so the topic uh, that our speakers are going to address is how, or excuse me, is what's wrong with our Congress. And I'll just point out this is really part of a two-part series. Uh, on April 9th, we're going to have two congressional scholars who've written extensively about Congress come and talk about how to fix Congress, although I think we'll hear some, uh, some uh, about that as well today. We have uh, two real experts on Congress because they both served in that body to talk about what is wrong with Congress. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Charles Deju, who represented Hawaii's first congressional district from 2010 to 2011. While in Congress, Charles was a member of both the House Armed Services and the Budget Committees. Before entering Congress, Charles served on the Honolulu City Council and in the Hawaii State House of Representatives where he was the mi uh, major minority leader. Charles is a major in the U.S. Army Reserve and is a combat veteran who served in Afghanistan and received the Combat Action Badge and the Army Commendation Medal. Charles attended the University of Pennsylvania where he earned degrees both in political science and economics, and he later received his law degree from the University of Southern California. He has taught co courses at both the University of Hawaii School of Law and Hawaii Pacific University. Our second guest today is David Mingi. David is a long-term resident of Minnesota. He graduated from St. Ulf's College and the University of Chicago School of Law. David was a practice, practicing attorney and taught law at the University of Wyoming before being elected to Congress in 1992, where he represented Minnesota's 2nd Congressional District. David held office for four terms, with major committee assignments on both the Agriculture and the Budget Committees. <coughs> While in Congress, David established the Minnesota River Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program and was a founding member of the Blue Dog Coalition. In 2002, David became a judge on the Minnesota Court of Appeals, from which he took senior status in 2012. Since that time, in addition to serving as a senior judge, David has served as a facilitator for a state, a state federal water quality program and taught courses at both the University of Minnesota School of Law and at St. Olaf's College. Welcome our two guests today. I think so because it's hard to see people okay. over here. Then I will, I will clip this on to you. Well, uh, is that for recording or is it for? It's, it's for recording, yeah. Okay. Hopefully I can hear myself again, <laughs> and, and I can correct what I say. Well, again, my name is David Mingi, and I'm from Minnesota. And I'd like to just uh, briefly make a couple of comments about um, uh, the functioning of Congress. I think it's important to realize that over the decades, this country has had uh, crises of many stripes and very divisive uh, politics. I mean, after all, think we had a civil war. I mean, what, what could be more divisive than that? And it was a bloody, bloody affair. Uh, we have had uh, duels. We have had uh, fisticuffs and caning of uh, uh, members of Congress, you know, one by the other. Uh, we haven't had anything like that here in the last 40 years. There was one incident where a fellow who, his name won't remain anonymous, but uh, who was Irish and uh, somewhat uh, uh, tempered, a Democrat, that we had to restrain because he wanted to go after some Republicans that he thought were uh, misrepresenting uh, what he had said. But, uh, I mean, nothing ever came of it. 
the, the point that I'm trying to make is it's easy to look back uh, 50 years, 100 years, and think that things must have been better. Because after all, we worked through all those crises, and today what we're facing looks like it's politically insoluble. But my point is, 150 years ago, many things looked insoluble, and it was just good luck, you might say, that we were able to pull through or muddle through. And I'm confident that one way or the other, that our country can pull together and that we can work through many of these highly contentious issues today, I mean, like immigration uh, reform. Second point I would uh, want to make is that we have a very badly divided society. So that, in a way, Congress mirrors what's going on in, in, in our communities. Uh, or in our homes. What, 50% of the marriages end in divorce? Even same-sex marriages we're seeing uh, end in a bitter disagreement and child custody fights? And uh, I mean, how can we ex expect that somehow things in Washington, D.C. are going to go more swimmingly or easier than in our own homes? I. Uh, I, I, I'm Scandinavian, Norwegian ancestry, and I've led bike tours. And uh, a year ago, we had a bike tour in this area of rural Minnesota that was almost all Norwegian farmers. And from one little knoll, you could look and you could see four Norwegian Lutheran church steeples, all little country churches. And I said uh, to one of the pastors, why do you need four tiny congregations here with one national origin and the same nominal, you know, Lutheran denom uh, uh, re re religious denomination. He said, well, we uh, found that uh, started out and they, start, they begin to disagree on predestination. And then we had two churches. One was predestination <laughs> and one was not. And, and then he said, we had another situation where the pastor's wife became a focal point of unhappiness in the church. Well, now they had three churches. And so it went. And they were just lucky there were only four. I mean, there could have been ten. And, and so I, you know, I think back about, you know, is it in our genes? Or, or what is it that makes us, um, as, you know, as human beings, uh, contentious like that? And, and that's reflected again, as I've pointed out, in Congress. Now, what can we do to improve it? Well, you know, I am... I, 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 I'm perplexed. I grew up in an era when Boy Scouts and 4-H and things like this were very uh, popular and common, and we had all of these service clubs, Lions, Rotary, Kiwanis, and so on. And uh, the community where I lived, people pulled together. And we, a lot of things were accomplished, you know, nice parks and um, good roads and uh, wonderful schools and libraries things like that, and, and it was like we'd reached the point where the Protestants weren't arguing with the Catholics, uh, the Swedes weren't arguing with the Norwegians, and it, it was like we were achieving something, a, a sense of community. And then I look back, and, and that same generation and the same community, you've got a Tea Party group, and you've got... Uh, a, you know, a Democrat or Republican group, and you have evangelicals, and you have uh, Unitarians, and next thing you know, uh, we have uh, Muslims, uh, Somalis uh, community has moved in to work in the meatpacking plant, and on and on, and it, it's become very diversified, but the divisions are just as much within the uh, Northern European Caucasian community as anywhere else. So, I'm thinking, well, how did it happen that those of us that grew up thinking that we worked together and learning Robert's Rules of Order became so disputatious? And uh, sometimes I think we should have congressional districts which are as po much as possible evenly balanced between the two parties. And hopefully that would uh, force candidates to run on a more moderate tone or with a more moderate tone and, and you wouldn't have as much polarization. But I understand 
Uh, political science studies indicate that even closely matched congressional district uh, uh, representation has resulted in a polarization as uh, safe, a lot of safe districts. So I mean, I'm told I'm, I'm a little bit off base on that. Um, it, it used to be that members of Congress lived in Washington, D.C. We didn't have jet, jet travel. And they um, had kids in the same schools, and they saw each other, let's say, at church or one thing or another. And uh, there was more bipartisanship or less partisanship. They got along. Well, that may be, you know, we're not going to do away with jet travel. And uh, certainly for people like from Hawaii or even Washington, uh, if you're going to get back to your district, uh, you, you don't want to be known as just kind of a Washington, D.C. person. And, and, and so we've lost some of that sense of community that was built out of, out of being in Washington. Uh, we've had external threats to our country. I think that's caused us to often coalesce. We don't have a Cold War anymore. And, and, and of course, we don't want a Cold War. I mean, we don't want this to force us to, to minimize our differences and get along better. But... Um, I think it's going to take an insistence by people who consider themselves moderate that they will be heard in the political process and that they expect whoever is representing them, whether it's the city council, school board, or Congress, operate or you know, tamp down the partisan rhetoric and that people have to make that clear and they have to hold uh, members of Congress accountable. So if my voting record or my press releases are saying what a wonderful bipartisan guy I am, and, and then, I shouldn't say voting record, but then it turns out that I am opposing the other party consistently, and it appears only for partisan reasons, to say that is not what's acceptable to us. We insist that you change how this goes on, and if you don't, we're going to actively oppose you in the next election and represent that this is the persuadable uh, and the important block of voters out there that are uh, severely disappointed and we need new representation. Well, you know, unless something like that begins to emerge, I think that um, it's too easy for um, people in Congress to kind of slip by and uh, talk one game and then play the party politic game uh, inside the caucus and let the caucus uh, kind of run uh, run the ship. So that, that's my two cents, and I'll defer to, to Charles for his. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for, for having me here. Um, thank you for the very hospitable uh, welcome I'm receiving here at Washington State University, even though I am a USC Trojan. So double thank you to all of all of you here. Um, let me begin by saying that I, I am in complete agreement with, with David's uh, comments here that, that America has faced enormous challenges before, and what we are seeing right now in the United States Congress isn't dramatically different, and indeed, it, it, nothing compared to what our nation faced in the 19th century, uh, and, and divisions in our, in our nation and our nation's capital have happened. Our nation has always found ways to heal those divisions and, and, and move our, our country forward. But perhaps my remarks here, uh, I want to focus maybe a little bit on what has happened in the very recent history and why we are where we are in, in, in 2015, in my own humble opinion. Um, why I think things have gotten so bitterly partisan, why Congress is beginning to just really just break down um, and we're not seeing the development of, of, of positive legislation for the benefit of the whole of the country. We're just not seeing legislation at all moving in, in, in the Congress. I think it has a lot to do with what has happened very recently in, in the last just a few years here in, in our nation. Um, what I have seen happen in, in American politics is this sort of adoption of total war uh, uh, in elections. That is, the Republican Party and Democratic Party, it is all about winning. Everything is focused on election day. And election day is the only thing that matters. And after you win the election, the next most important thing isn't what you do in Congress. It is the next election. And, and, and either getting reelected or getting the guy you don't like out of office. Uh, what, what I've seen just very recently in the last 10 years uh, is it's a series of steps that I think has magnified and made that total war process worse. 
um, in uh, 2006, the Democrats uh, uh, named Rahm Emanuel as, as chairman of the DCCC. Uh, in some response, I think, to justified response to the Republicans having Tom DeLay as, as the majority whip, uh, really sort of exercising a iron fist rule over, over the Congress. And uh, Rahm Emanuel's strategy in 2006 was we're going to wipe out the moderate Republicans. We're going to target, we're going to go after, and we're going to wipe out the, the moderate Republicans, and that is going to be our path to victory. And he was right. He was successful. Uh, uh, he he took out a huge section of of moderate Republicans um, and replaced them with Democrats. But then, in 2010, the process was flipped. The Republicans said, "Well, by and large, in, in 2006, the moderate Republicans were replaced by blue dog Democrats." Um, and the Blue Dog Democrat Caucus swelled. Uh, uh, David is, is one of the founding members of the Blue Dog Caucus. Uh, I think they had uh, 56, 58 members, something like that. Um, so about a third of the Democratic Caucus. 2010, the Republicans returned the favor upon the Democrats, targeting the Blue Dogs as the path to the majority, wiping out the Blue Dog Democrats. And today, the Blue Dog Caucus, I think, is just barely over a dozen members. I mean, it is... It is a huge shift from nearly 60 members to just a tiny handful now of Blue Dog Democrats. But what happened? The Republicans who replaced the Blue Dog Democrats weren't replacing moderate Republicans who, uh, with, with, with these Blue Dog Democrats. They were being replaced with Tea Party conservative Republicans. So what has happened here is, is the Democrats in 2006 wiped out the moderate Republicans – uh, and decimated the, 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 the sort of moderate wing of, of, of the GOP. And in 2010, the GOP wiped out the moderate wing of, of the Democrats. And, and now what we have in 2015 are two parties which are pretty much bereft of, of moderates, um, that ideologically the Democrats are all, virtually all, liberal, and the Republicans are virtually all conservative. Um, you know, I, I share with individuals, uh, the National Journal, a major national publication, uh, ranks all the members of Congress from the most liberal to the most conservative, and I think they started their rankings in uh, 1982. Back in 1982, um, they ranked something like 250 out of the 435 members of the U.S. House as r resting between the liberal most Republican and the conservative most Democrat, 250 out of 435. Uh, today, I think that number has shrunk down to 10 out of – and, and, and so what you see here is, is, is the Republicans have all shifted to the conservative side. Democrats have all shifted to the liberal side, and that, that band in the middle is very, very small. Um, just as a side note here, uh, David is a blue dog Democrat. When I was in Congress uh, in, in the 20 – uh, 111th Congress when there were only 10. I was one of those 10, just as a, as a side note here. But the question now becomes, well, what the heck do we do about it? I mean, I think there's a lot of adjustments that that procedurally uh, 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 can be made. I think there's an outside influence of special interest groups. Um, David has correctly pointed out here there's a lot less comedy that goes on between the caucuses. I think there's a lot less level of trust between Republicans and Democrats uh, uh, in our Congress. But you know what? For me, what I think long term, the only true real structural form that is going to fix this bitter divide and this, this, this dysfunction in our Congress, to be perfectly blunt, is to get Americans to care. Um, increasingly fewer and fewer and fewer Americans are voting and participating in our Congress. The only people who are voting and are participating in our democracy tend to be individuals who not just only identify themselves as Republicans or Democrats, but identify themselves as conservative Republicans or liberal Democrats. Americans who self-identify as moderates or self-identify as independents increasingly are not participating in a democratic process. And it's almost sort of a, a self-fulfilling, I, I think, prophecy in the sense that the more moderates and independents drop out and don't vote and don't participate, 
the more you increase the power and influence of the conservative and liberal wings of Republican and Democrats, and then the more influence the Republican conservative wing and the Democrat liberal wing have, the less influence moderates feel that they have, and the more they drop out and participate less in American politics. You know, for me, um, it, it, it is somewhat surprising, disturbing, disappointing. You know, um, the first political campaign I ever ever participated in was in 1986. I was a teenager. I was in I was in high school, and, and I volunteered for the woman who was running for Hawaii's first congressional district. Um, 25 years later, I was very honored to become the congressman for Hawaii's first congressional district. But what I found disturbing was, even though the district had increased, I don't know the exact number, something like 20 percent in population, the number of voters actually went down. That, that, that we have fewer voters 25 years later actually going to the polls and voting, even though the population was 20 percent bigger. And, and if we want to heal this, if we want our country and our, and our nation and our Congress to work and to function, ultimately it's got to be and come down to Americans and more specifically getting average Americans, middle America, to participate and take ownership of that democracy that unfortunately right now they feel that they do not have a – a voice or a hand in. Okay. We have about a half an hour for questions and answers, and uh, maybe I'll start off with one. Um, you know, from a democratic standpoint, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have ideologically polarized parties. Mm -hmm. They present clear choices to the electorate, and especially if you have a divided society that have very strong views. And as you've pointed out, we've had periods in our history when we've had equally polarized parties as we do today. In fact, in many ways, the post-war period is a, an anomaly in American history. But there is nevertheless something distinct about this period, and that is that our polarized parties aren't worried about policy making; They're worried about elections, as <laughs> you point out. So, so my question is, is, what are the factors that are leading to that? And I, what I didn't hear from either of you is uh, any discussion about the role of money and, and uh in, in our, our campaigns and our elections and how that might be polarizing the parties and making it incapable to address issues. And, and secondly, the polarized media. Mm -hmm. and maybe I'll, I'll take up that fast. Let me take the second part of your, your question sure. first, and that is the, the role of media. And let me actually expand it to the role of technology. And that is something I think has changed American politics today in the 21st century that hasn't existed before uh, uh, in American history, and that is – this, this advent of instantaneous everything, uh, instantaneous Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, uh, YouTube. Indeed, I, if I'm not mistaken, Richard is telling me that this presentation will be up on YouTube within a couple of hours. <laughs> um, Hopefully I, I sooner. Think, okay, well, maybe even sooner. Okay. <laughs> be careful. Um, yeah. it, 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 has, um, it has led to a breakdown of, of I think, uh, trust. Um, it, it is much more difficult today to collaborate, to throw out ideas and just have a broad-based discussion when, I mean, as a public figure, you're already in a fishbowl, but to compound upon this, that anything and everything you say is almost instantaneously broadcast throughout the world. Uh, and the media today has become significantly more diffuse. I, I think the media today also is has increasingly become catering to specific markets. That that is, it's no longer broadcasting media. It's it's narrow casting. It, it is, um, it, um, MSNBC and Fox have specific audiences that they specifically want to target, rather than the public as a whole. A print media is, is, is the same way here. I, I mean, you you look when I. When, when Politico was first founded, um, and I don't know if any of you guys read the newspaper Politico, I mean, I think it was generally broad-based, but as increasingly as time gone on, I think they figured out they sell more ads uh, targeting a narrow segment of, of the overall population and slant the news in that, in that direction. That, I do believe, is problematic. Again, how do you change it? Well, you change it by getting average Americans to start caring about this and demanding something different. On the, issue, on the aspect of, of special interest groups, I do believe, and I am very concerned, that special interest groups are taking on far too large a role uh, in our democracy. There is a proper time and place for special interest groups. Um, but what is happening here is, is when the vast middle of America is dropping out of elections, not caring, not voting, and not really paying attention to what is, what is going on in, in our government, what you leave is a much, much smaller electorate 
and that smaller electorate, a, a tiny special interest group, their influence becomes greater. Uh, and increasingly greater the more the middle continues to just sort of drop out of, of our overall electorate. Um, and it, it's what is happening with special interest group politics. It's happening on, on both sides here is, is Republicans are increasingly pandering just to the, to the conservative interest groups and Democrats are pandering only to the, the liberal interest groups. And there are hardly any broad-based interest groups that are interested in working with both sides. For them, it's one side. Or the other, and again, it's this concept of just total war that goes on in our in our elections, which I think is unfortunate. But David, I, I defer to you and your, your thoughts. Because I can't see people over here when I'm sitting down at the table. I'll, I'll uh, stand up. Um, I, I'd like to mention a couple of things uh, relevant to your question. In terms of uh, media, I certainly agree with what uh, Charles has said, but it's important for us to remember that. Um, uh, we had scandal sheets, we had anonymous uh, pamphleteers, and a lot of things that were going on uh, all the way back to the founding of this country. And that was just the way politics was. And there were things that were said about Thomas Jefferson, just as an example, that you would never expect to see in any campaign or in print today. And so that type of character assassination um, is something that we've lived through, and then we look back and we romanticize uh, the period when it uh, was so significant. Uh, I do think we've lost something in the sense that when I was a kid, the major networks had the evening news, and the country was tuned into that, and by and large, that evening news presentation was more even-handed, and it was uh, more, I don't know, moderate, and you didn't have quite the same polarization that you find with um, uh, news media outlets, which today uh, tend to identify with or are sponsored by uh, one side or the other. Um, with respect to um, money, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, various expenditures, you might call them independent expenditures, uh, and campaign contributions uh, can be very destructive of uh, a, a sort of a wholesome and uh, uh, well-functioning political process. And unfortunately, the courts, in this case the U.S. Supreme Court, have equated money with the First Amendment and uh, corporations with persons in this regard. And the consequence is that campaign finance reform efforts have largely been undone. And the prospect of doing something that's aggressive to try to limit the role of money in politics is uh, increasingly difficult. Now, if we could write on a fresh slate, you would hope that some of the reforms would have survived and we could extend them and we could uh, diminish the effect of money in politics. I mean, we have uh, Soros, we have the Koch brothers, uh, we have others that uh, are identified with having spent enormous sums on independent expenditures or campaign uh, contributions and uh, contributing to this polarization. Uh, there is talk of trying to have uh, public financing of campaigns. I can tell you that in Congress, uh, if one announced that you were in favor of public financing of campaigns, you would become the subject of attack ads in the next election. It was like you just wanted to open the U.S. Treasury to uh, raids by you politicians. And what an irresponsible thing to do. So by and large, even people who, who favored public financing uh, were reluctant to become identified with it. They thought there were other issues they'd rather talk about, and they didn't want to be put on the defensive because of it. So we haven't had uh, much support of public financing. But I, I think it is one positive way of trying to tamp down uh, some of the influence of outside money. Okay. So the question back there? Um, I think gerrymandering is, is bad. Uh, I think it's anti-democratic. Of course, it has been something, I mean, after all, the, the, the phrase gerrymandering dates back to the founding of our nation uh, and, and the formation of the very first uh, congressional districts. 
I think um, bipartisan uh, redistricting commissions should be adopted. I think they're a long-term one of the reforms that I think would help uh, address uh, these problems that we have with uh, such hyper-partisanship going on in the United States Congress. The difficulty, of course, with, with getting bipartisan redistricting commissions implemented is you've got to ask the politicians themselves uh, uh, to implement this. Um, I realize what I'm saying uh, as a Republican is, is probably not shared by a lot of Republicans, given that the, the GOP now owns uh, the overwhelming majority of legislative chambers in, in our nation. But I, I, I think this concept that politicians can pick their voters instead of the voters picking their politicians is just – it's just simply wrong. Um, let me also just quickly go on a, a tangent just to follow up on something also David uh, uh, mentioned. Let me also just add one more thing, and that is to fix our, our, our current situation in our Congress today, I do think a, a missing component is leadership. Um, it, it, and presidential leadership does have an impact on our Congress. You know, for me, I have been disappointed in, in President Obama in I, – I think he had numerous opportunities – to bring people together and chose not to. I contrast that, on the other hand. I, uh, as a Republican, marveled at Bill Clinton uh, back in the 90s after the Democrats lost control uh, of the Congress. Um, he got in there, um, pulled people together, and, 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 and got things done. And I think as we look forward to the 2016 elections, I think that is something that I want to encourage all of you here to consider in terms of who we want for our, leading our nation and try to heal these these bitter divides here in, in, in America. Well, with respect to gerrymandering, um, I agree with the use of these uh, redistricting commissions. Unfortunately, we have this case before the U.S. Supreme Court as we speak. They've already had oral arguments. And uh, the uh, challenge is that the Constitution says, the U.S. Constitution, that the House of Representatives' uh, seats are to be apportioned by the legislatures. And so... If you're an original constructionist, uh, the question is, what does it mean when you say legislature? And can the legislature or a state constitution be amended to delegate that uh, to a commission? And uh, we should know by the end of the summer uh, what the constitution really means. And, of course, we might be quite unhappy with what the Supreme Court uh, comes up with. So I guess stay tuned. Um, in Minnesota, uh, we can't even get the legislature and the governor to agree on the districts. So the courts have done it, I think, for the last 40 years, if not 50 years. And, uh, you know, whether those districts are better or not, I don't know. But we had one congressional district re represented by Michelle Bachman, who you may have heard of. And we had another congressional district represented by Keith Ellison, who is the first African-American, uh, from Minnesota at least, but also the first Muslim elected to Congress. So, I mean, what a contrast. And, and he's, he's very liberal um, uh, to go along with it. So uh, it, it's a tough thing to do. I've seen that you don't have to run this through the legislature, fortunately, in a lot of states, because you can do it with an initiative and a referendum uh, or a constitutional amendment, and, and you can bypass the state legislature. It sounds like this court's going to strike those down, though. <laughs> <laughs> so. See, we have a question back here. Positive consequences of polarization. You see positive, positive <laughs> impacts of polarization. Yeah. Well, go ahead. You know, real quickly, you know, perhaps I mean one benefit of of this polarization. It's, it's ha hard to, to say there's actually a benefit to it all. Um, that I do think that uh, uh, politicians are forced to be a heck of a lot more honest. You can't be duplicitous. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, during the era. Of, uh, Immediately before and after the Second World War, I mean, you had politicians engaging in, in affairs and nefarious uh, deals uh, behind closed doors with lobbyists and, and cor corporations and whatnot here. Um, that, I think, is a, is a, is a time gone. Uh, you don't today see members of Congress turning a blind eye to peccadilloes of, of their colleagues. And so I think if there is a positive in this because they're so aggressive and so competitive – you don't see um, infractions brushed under the rug any longer. Well, I think, 
I think that one of the problems that we have uh, with the polarization is the lack of the ability to compromise. It means turn compromise into uh, a four-letter word. Uh, and it, the, the compromise is the art of the possible, and effective solutions to many of our problems are a result of compromises. The U.S. Constitution is a product of a series of compromises, and uh, uh, some might say, well, of course, we got the Civil War as a result. But on the other hand, uh, the Civil War was not inevitable, and uh, those compromises made it possible for the 13 colonies to come together. implicitly blame the American people for the polarization of the uh, Why aren't they demanding more partisanship and so forth? Since we're in Mr. S in, in Mr. Fuller's place uh, here, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your views on congressional leadership. You talked about the president. Uh, what about Nancy Pelosi? What about John Boehner? Uh, what are they doing or what could they be doing better uh, to kind of bridge the cast? So the question is, um, what about congressional leadership being to blame for the polarization as opposed to uh, the voters or, you know, those of you in the room as opposed to us? Um, well, I served with Tom Foley and Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner and knew all of them. Uh, I think they are very uh, incredibly capable individuals. And I don't view any of them as uh, terribly polarizing. Maybe Nancy Pelosi because she represents San Francisco, uh, would be singled out as, as having a more uh, liberal record than either of the others, uh, uh, being closer to an extreme. But uh, uh, John Boehner has the ability to get along with uh, Democrats, uh, but he is in a box trying to lead a caucus or the Republican conference and uh, not being able to hold on to his position as speaker if, if he doesn't satisfy most of the major blocks within that that group. Um, and Nancy Pelosi was campaigning for leader of the uh, Democratic side uh, at the time that I was in Congress, and uh, I had lunch and coffee with her, and you know, she wanted me to vote for her. I voted for Steny Hoyer. <laughs> I thought he was a more, um, uh, I guess, a moderate individual in terms of his voting record. But the problem that we have is that the uh, fringes, so to speak, are driving the agenda. And one of the major fears that an incumbent has is there's going to be a, prime, a contested primary. And, of course, that will come not from the moderates in the party, typically, but from the fringe. And so you don't want that contested primary, and you don't want that more spirited end of your caucus uh, running against you and sniping at you all the time. And... That's a political fact of life. And the way the parties are organized, I'm not sure that we're ever going to overcome that. Uh, unless we can persuade those of you, I mean, the great American voting public with college degrees and everything, to get engaged and demand more of us. You know, politics is not a spectator sport. It's like intramurals in a sense. It's a participatory activity. And uh, unless uh, we have broad-based participation, we don't get the benefits of the system. And uh, I don't know how else to put it, but, but, I, but I think that in a way we almost have to throw it back uh, to, to you. you know, let me um, follow up on what David was saying to address your, your, your question. Yes, I very much believe – Congressional leadership shares a, a lion's share of this blame of, of polarization uh, that we see here in our nation today. But let me just explain or perhaps illustrate for, for all of you what the leaders' pressures are and, and, and the sort of the context that they face. If you want to be – well, right now Democrats are in the minority, so the minority leader of the Democratic caucus or if you're a Republican, if you want to be the, the Speaker of the House, how do you get there? You need a majority of your caucus – to vote for you. And if you can't get the majority of your caucus to solidly stick behind you, you're just not going to stay the leader of your respective caucus. What's going on in, in American politics with this polarization going on in the congressional districts in, an, in our elections 
the only members who you can always count on year after year after year to stay in the Congress. If you're in the Republican Congress, it's the conservative Republicans from the conservative and most congressional districts. The Democrats you can count on to hold your leadership position are the liberal most Democrats from the liberal most districts in our nation. Trying to rest your position as leader on the moderates, Republicans or moderate Democrats, is, is building a foundation of sand because the moderates constantly are getting wiped out. And so, uh, and what, what David is pointing out here, I mean, the, this Steny Hoyer was, I think, is, is a more moderate uh, uh, Democrat than, than Nancy Pelosi, but has struggled to, to find his coalition to build majority within the Democratic caucus, whereas Nancy Pelosi building her base to be leader amongst California Democrats, women Democrats, the Congressional Black Caucus, constantly getting reelected is a much more solid base to build a leadership platform from. Uh, it, it, which brings me back to the one position that can sort of cut through all of this. Uh, honestly, the one, the, the one position that can really hopefully unify all of this is the position of the presidency of the United States. And I would add, it is a very narrow window that right after the president gets elected and takes office, the president has just a few months to set the tone of his or her presidency, and that will set it, it – it, for the next four years of, of that administration's term. So uh, while I'm not very hopeful things are going to change very, very much between now and the 2016 election, cautiously optimistic that come January 2017, maybe perhaps things can change a little bit. Uh, my question is primarily for uh, Mr. Zhao. Yeah. Uh, Oh, very good question. Um, how things different between a state legislature versus uh, uh, the United States Congress? Um, you know, a few things uh, uh, just jump out at you. Um, you know, I, I, I was sharing with you in, in, in the previous class. You know, for me, I was the, the minority leader uh, in the Hawaii State House. And for me, when I went into the Congress, I kind of went in with this mentality, this is going to be the difference between jumping from, you know, the NCAA to, to the NFL. I mean, that, that's the kind of leap I mentally thought was going to go on in my head. A better analogy is that it's a leap from peewee football to the NFL. Uh, I mean, it is just a totally different scale. The, the level of intensity, the level of scrutiny, uh, uh, the, the, the pace of the work is just so much more intense in the Congress than it is in any other legislative body I, ha I have served in. Um, w uh, one of the huge differences I found being in the state legislature or, or in the city council versus in the Congress is interestingly enough how fast things work uh, or can work in the Congress. Um, when I was in the state legislature, even though the Hawaii state legislature was only a part-time legislature and even though we only met a few times a month, uh, our parliamentary rules are similar to most other state legislatures in the nation, and that is it requires, in order to pass legislation, you must go through three hearings. A bill must sit on the floor for 48 hours three different times. Uh, there's a very strong respect for the committee uh, process. Um, you go to Congress, and you can move legislation in a matter of hours, uh, uh, and, and the speed to which, the, especially on the House side, more so than the Senate side, the speed to which the, the Speaker of the House can bring the legislation to the floor, uh, uh, for me, was, was stunning. And I think that perhaps adds to that level of partisanship. Um, l let me all give you just a very quick example. You know, when I was in Congress, one of the major pieces of legislation that was moving through was Dodd-Frank. This is the, the Financial Services Industry Reform Bill. It was a major plank of the Democratic Party uh, uh, trying to move it through. This bill was 1,500 pages long. Uh, speaker, at the time, it was Nancy Pelosi was the speaker, was trying to find her 218 votes, and she couldn't get it. Uh, she, she wasn't there. She was only like a 210 votes or so. What happened was is she started working her, her caucus and saying, hey, look, what, what can I change? What can I change? What do you need here? Is there something in your district that I can give you? Um, and she would just adjust this 1,500-page bill, inserting things here and there. And all of a sudden, she hit 218. And like that, in less than 60 minutes, brought the bill to the floor and called a vote. Uh, as soon as she got it, 
that that last members that she needed and immediately brought it to the floor. For me, that is something that never could have happened in the Hawaii State Legislature or the Honolulu City Council, but in Congress can and does happen, as the, indeed we saw just a week ago with the Homeland Security Bill. Uh, that is, for me, it was a very stark, stark difference. And David, I know, was on the school board before he came to Congress, so that was an even more pronounced difference. So, Well, on the school board, we move stuff really fast. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would say typically in Congress things are moving uh, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the speed is not um, a, a characteristic. Uh, one thing that, that I have heard, and, and maybe you would have more experience with this, is that in Congress the minority part – uh, sorry, in the state legislature, the minority party members have a much greater chance to participate in – introducing legislation that will ultimately pass and uh, participation in the floor and the committee process so that um, uh, uh, partisanship is tamped down and um, being in the minority is not nearly uh, – you're not closed down like you feel that you are in the House of Representatives. Now, the House of Representatives is a majoritarian body, so all you need is you know, a working majority of one and you control the floor and you control the flow of leg legislation. The Senate is a different world. So the comments that we're making about this would not really apply at all in the Senate. And, and the opportunity to slow things down or the insistence that everything be slowed down uh, is commonplace in the Senate. Maybe if there's a, you know, it, it seems to me that the Koch brothers should be in jail. And that we, we want to say, you know, it's sort of a two-way street, but in fact the Republicans work very, very hard to say that science is just liberal conclusions and uh, the sort of obscurantism they throw into the global warming debate seems to me criminal. Why aren't the Koch brothers in jail? Or why, why isn't it treason? Why isn't it treason to willfully deny what you know to be true? I mean, especially when it affects so many people. Isn't that part of the problem that science has been sort of you know, actually, now? Perhaps as the Republican here. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me begin. Just take your question. The way you ask that question, I think, is symptomatic of, of the problem we have with American politics. Uh, if, if you were a conservative, you wouldn't ask, what's wrong with the Koch brothers? Aren't they in jail? If you're a Republican, you would be saying, what's wrong with George Soros? And why isn't George Soros in jail? And what about George Soros's views on finance and, 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 and global economy and whatnot here and globalization here? And, and so my point here being is, is – our, our, our electorate, our people, our, our elections are becoming so incredibly divisive and um, personal. Uh, it's about the Koch brothers. It's about George Soros and their billions of dollars. It's, 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 it's Nancy Pelosi is evil or Mitch McConnell is, is bad. And it is no longer a discussion about underlying policy. Do you believe this is good policy for our nation as a whole. And I do think that that does and is a contribution to what is, what is wrong and why we can't have a mature discussion in our electorate and in our Congress because so much of it is about assigning blame and personalizing everything here. You take these views. You must take these views. You must be unscientific. You must be stupid and irrational because you took a donation from the Koch brothers. You must not understand basic economics. You must be a bad person because you took a donation from, from George Soros. Well, first let me say I agree with half of what you said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times uh, I've heard the phrase sound science. And uh, half the time the sound science comes from, let's say, the business community. Uh, they're saying... Uh, GMOs or whatever it is, it's all gone through the FDA and university testing, and uh, we're just hu we're hung up on uh, a phobia out there. And uh, the WTO has said that America is protectionist because 
uh, we want country of origin labeling or you know whatever it might be. And half the time it's coming um, uh, from, let's say, the academic community saying global warming is a reality and uh, there's a consensus and efforts to sabotage environmental or greenhouse gas legislation is completely irresponsible. It's potentially destructive of our civilization or the human race. And I mean, unfortunately, uh, we had a president of Exxon who thought global warming was bunk and uh, carbon uh, emissions and so on were not a problem. And he apparently spent a lot of money on this. And this, I think, was somebody with a PhD. Um, uh, and I may have been an engineer. I'm not saying he was in, you know, <laughs> the hard sciences, but um, whatever. The other, um, I've got no, I've, <laughs> the, uh, I, I have a, a page here on this uh, cover, which will be my uh, Pullman, Washington page, because I've got all kinds of notes. But, um, uh, well, I, I think that pretty much summarizes you what I was saying. Sound science? Is there still such a thing? <laughs> Well, yes, I do. I mean, I grew up in a family. My, my father was a doctor, and after all, the, the whole medical system we have is based on research, and it's based on what works and what does not. And I remember being uh, amazed that people would be challenging vaccinations, and yet I had friends out here in rural Minnesota did not want to vaccinate their kids. And my father-in-law was a dentist, and here I had fillings, amalgam fillings in my mouth, and uh, was lead leaching into my system? Was I being poisoned by mercury? Or, you know, what is the problem with these fillings? And uh, I thought, well, you know, my father-in-law is not out to poison me. Um, he's trying to pass <laughs> this burden of supporting his daughter off to somebody else. <laughs> so it goes. But, yes, I believe in sound science. Okay. One, time for one last question. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, Congressman Mickey, I'd just like to say I really like your shirts. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, from, <laughs> it's from Oregon, Pendleton. Yes, uh, yeah, that's the best place to get them. Um, but the, uh, returning quickly to the idea of uh, the expediency by which bills are discussed and voted on and then passed, um, a common complaint le levied against members of Congress is that they don't take the time to read the bills. They don't know what they're voting on. And the example that you mm -hmm. provided about uh, Nancy Pelosi going around and, like, guaranteeing people individual kickbacks for their support on this bill. I was kind of wondering, like, is that where these large pieces of legislation hinge on, or how well informed are members of Congress actually, and if they are well informed, what kind of staff do they bring around themselves to bring in the information so they're as well informed as possible? Um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the Congress can pass these voluminous legislation um, thousands of pages long. You know, um, for myself personally, I, I mean, I was a professor before I uh, before I got involved in politics. You know, when I was in the state legislature and, and when I was in the city council, I prided myself. I was in the distinct, distinct minority, but I prided myself that I read every single bill that I voted on. I mean, I, from from the beginning to the end, every single piece of of legislation. When you got to when I got to Congress. That was just not possible. First, the volume is far too high. And then second, the bills are just so incredibly long. So what do you do to, to rectify it? Um, for me, it, it's, it's two things. Number one, um, staff. You have to rely on your staff. You have to hire good staff. Uh, to those of you who uh, are here at Washington State or are thinking of careers in, in public service, let me just strongly encourage all of you here. Um, there are very few jobs uh, out there uh, that will give you that enormous amount of responsibility that quickly um, as being a, a, a staffer on, on Capitol Hill. Now, of course, it commensurately pays very low. That's why nobody else other than young college graduates want to do this. Um, but no, no, let me just encourage all of you to consider it and, and, and think about uh, uh, doing that as a career. Uh, second aspect here in terms of how did I deal with it here is you develop relationships. Uh, you, you have to learn... Um, that you and your district, certain things matter. On those things that matter, you, you take a very strong uh, interest in and making sure that legislation is, is targeted the right way. And those that are not, you got to just rely on, on your colleagues in the Congress. And again, let me give you examples. You know, for me, representing Hawaii's first congressional district, for me, the priorities were 
number one, the, the visitor industry, and specifically as a congressman, the international tourist visas and, and how our, our country was handing out tourist visas. And then second, of course, the second biggest industry in my congressional district was defense. I had Pearl Harbor, Hickam Air Force Base, uh, Schofield Barracks. I was very interested in, in the defense bill. But things came up like the farm bill. Um, you know, I have no wheat growing in my district. Um, I, I, I learned who the members of Congress uh, really knew their stuff on, on, on agriculture, like David Mingi. And, and I would look to see how they voted. And quite frankly, I, I would just copy their votes. Uh, I, the, 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 for those of you who are undergraduates, the way to, to think about this here is it's kind of sort of like you go to class, okay, and every single class that you go to, you know who the smart kid is in the class. And the thing in Congress is, you know, there's going to be the smart kid in chemistry, the smart kid in history, the smart kid in whatever the literature class is. You figure out who the smart kid is in each class, and whatever that smart kid does, if you like them and kind of just generally agree with them, just copy them <laughs> and do them. And then you make sure that you're the smart kid in the class that matters a lot to your district. So for me, it was defense. For me, it was, it was tourism. And that's where I really you know, honed my stuff on. And then on the agriculture class, you know, uh, uh, well, shoot, I just find out who the smart agriculture kid is and just do what he does. Well, you ask a, uh, a wonderful question. I like your shirt, too. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think there are a couple things you have to realize. And uh, one is that uh, there are uh, hundreds of uh, trade associations and other groups that are looking at legislation and they're preparing short summary sheets of bills, and each caucus, a Democrat and Republican, doing the same thing. And so you have these available to you, and your staff will go through some of them and identify the ones that are important for your district or uh, line up with your perspective and then advise you what uh, they're saying about the bill. Uh, also, the bills are being drafted uh, by a professional group of almost all lawyers hired by Congress in the, um, uh, in, in this drafting office, and they are uh, career people. They're very, they're very highly skilled, and so the legislation you know has gone through this, uh, this very professional preparation stage, and you're dealing w often with issues that have incredible ramifications and complexity, and you're not going to be able to deal with health care reform without amending literally hundreds by, of other parts of the United States Code. And if you don't prepare the bill well, it, it isn't much good. And to do it well is going to take a lot, of, uh, a lot of pages. And I tried to read bills in Congress, and sometimes people thought I'd read the whole bill and they'd ask me, but uh, I, I agree, you, you simply cannot keep up. Uh, if I could make a concluding comment, um, now, as, as Charles said, we're, we're, we're pleased to have the opportunity to be in Pullman at the Washington State University. And uh, we are coming here as a part of the Congress to Campus program that's uh, sponsored by uh, former members of Congress. Uh, we, we get a plane ticket uh, out here, and uh, we're put up in, in a nice um, uh, Holiday, Holiday Inn yeah. Express uh, <laughs> hotel. <laughs> and, I mean, it's very nice. And, 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 and we're, we're, we're happy to do it. I mean, we're, we're not compensated for it otherwise. And um, part of why we're doing this is to show you uh, what the two members, uh, former members of Congress, get along. And that for most members of Congress, uh, working collaboratively is an aspiration that they have when they came and one that they would like to maintain as kind of an operating principle. It's very difficult. But in any event, uh, people are not at each other's throats. Another reason that uh, we are... Uh, coming to campuses, is that we want to encourage uh, everyone, especially uh, uh, college students, to consider careers in public service. And public service includes running for office, uh, working in campaigns, uh, working uh, in civil service or in state, federal, local agencies. Uh, there are many wonderful, uh, very idealistic, and um, fulfilling opportunities out there, and, and we're here in part to, to encourage you to consider that. So. Uh, we appreciate the chance uh, to be here, and I know I say this on behalf of both of us. Um, we've been treated uh, royally. Uh, you have a wonderful community and uh, a wonderful university. So thank you. Okay. 
So unfortunately, our time's up. I just have two quick announcements before I'm going to ask you to join me again in thanking our guests. Uh, the first is those who may be here for a class, I see a few of you. There's a sign-up sheets out, out in the hall on the way out. Uh, secondly, those of you who want to, we have several more events upcoming this semester. Uh, if you want to receive notifications of our events, go to Facebook, like us on Facebook. Just want to remind you about that. Uh, now on behalf of the Institute, I want to thank you all for coming out today. Join me now once again in thanking our guests for really enlightening